it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcasting with Monica Murray, RDH, MBA. In addition to her 17 years of clinical experience, Monica is an executive coach for Fortune Magazine, where she coaches teams on implementing tools and strategies customized to meet the individual needs of the practice. This includes customized programs targeted on excellent communication, scheduling for increased production, financial policies, accountability, and building a strong hygiene department. As a former client of Fortune Management, she believes in the teachings, and that is crucial for a practice to build a strong relationship with their patients by being extraordinary. Monica received her Bachelor of Science in Dental Hygiene from the College of Southern Nevada. She began her career with a leading periodontal practice which specialized in state-of-the-art dental technologies. She extended her hygiene career to sales, brand management, and a public speaker, focusing on preventative and aesthetic procedures. This avenue inspired her to have a true passion for the business side of dentistry, thus leading her to obtain an MBA. A past global speaker and educational consultant, Monica has presented a wide range of topics to audiences throughout the world. She presents a variety of educational programs while initiating and maintaining collaborative working relationships with dental and dental hygiene, key opinion leaders, and professional associations. She continues her clinical practice in Utah, volunteering with the Northern component of the Utah Dental Hygiene Association. Outside of her career aspirations, she enjoys spending time with her family and friends, cooking, traveling, and staying active through hiking, mountain biking, kickboxing, water sports, and snowboarding. It is an honor to have you on the show today. Thank you, Howard. It's an honor to be here. Oh, you're too kind. So, do you, you know, do you really think, um, I get this all the time that, you know, I'm 56, I've been out 31 years. A lot of these millennials, they come out of school and they go, Howard, you don't realize it's a different world today. I graduated 30 years ago. It was the golden age. Dentistry was great. Now they're coming out with $350,000 of student loans, DSOs popping up everywhere. Do you think the opportunity to have a successful dental office as this, is the same today in 2018 as it was in 1987? Absolutely not. I do think that exactly what you just said, there's a competitive market out there with the DSOs, and I'm not, I'm personally not a super big fan of how they set it up for these dentists coming out. Um, it sounds beautiful and, you know, unicorns and rainbows, and I don't think that it helps them be successful as business owners slash entrepreneurs, if you will. So what advice would you give to them if they're coming out? If, if your daughter just graduated from dental school, and not saying you're old enough to have a daughter that came out of dental school, but if you did, and you just had her graduate today, um, and her name was Monica Murray II, what, what, what advice would you give her? I, I really am a firm believer in vision, and that's part of what we teach at Fortune. If you don't know where you want to go, how are you going to get there? It's just like a vacation. If you don't have some idea of what you want, it's really hard to obtain that. And I think many dentists, if it were Monica Murray Jr. or the second, I truly believe that if she were to say, I just want to practice dentistry, great, then go work for a company. But if you truly want to have that entrepreneurial spirit and be a small business owner and or a large business owner or have multiple offices at some point, be very clear on where you want to go because that will set you up for success and or could set you up for failure from the get-go. Well, that's a great point. Do you think more dentists 30 years ago had a business entrepreneurial, wanted to own their own practice than 30 years later today? No, I think it's actually the opposite. More people want to own it today, and they understand that they're not just a dentist. They're also a small business owner, but that's what it was 30-plus years ago. You went to school, you came out, you started a business, but nobody considered themselves a small business owner. Yeah, so so who, what is your typical client? I mean, who's calling you at Fortune? What kind of offices are you going into? What, what is your uh, um, common, uh, you know, like a dentist has a root canal filling in a crowd. What are like the top three reasons people are calling you to come into their office and what are you doing for them? I think there's there's really two. Obviously, the common thread is I want to work less and make more, don't we all? Um, I think in addition to that, if you look at the structure of how dental school is set up, they, he or she coming out of dental school is very successful at, like you said, prepping a crown, placing an implant, whatever that might be. The dental side of things are very clear, and the clinical um, excellence is there. 
the business side of things are not discussed. And if they are, they're discussed in very minute measures. So you come out and you're wearing multiple hats. Not only are you the performing practicing dentist, but you're also the HR manager hiring and firing. You're also the accountant that's trying to run your QuickBooks. You're the guy that's ordering or the girl that's, that's ordering. You're wearing all these hats and you're not set up for success. There's no company out there that you wear all of those hats and you do really well. Like you said, you're a working manager. Would you recommend that they uh, start at Novo, start from scratch, buy an existing, do demographics matter? Yeah, I, I think, again, going back to the vision, and if you have no vision, talk to somebody that can help pull one out of you. Because if you come out of dental school and you, say, take over a transitionary dentist that's wanting to, you know, he'll be your associate for a few years, you buy into it, you get his patient base, you find out that, you don't know anything about the business. You know, do your homework. What kind of patient base do you want? What is your target audience? Do you want an older crowd, a younger crowd, a mix of people? I think when you go into a specialty like pedo, for example, you know exactly who your target audience is. Most people coming out of school aren't in a specialty situation, so they're taking what they can get. And I think it's really important to understand what is it that you want to provide and don't live in that scarcity mode just because you're coming out. Be clear. And that's uh, probably sums up the last numbers I saw were for 2016 that the average dentist in America in 2016 netted 187,000, uh, but this average specialist was over 300,000. And a big part of that is just because they have a target market. They do. They absolutely do. It's, it's, it's very specified to what they want to do. I want to work on kids, and I'm not doing molar endo, you know, or whatever that might be. Yeah, and with the, such a fast-changing world, I, I, I never I, – I think the general dentist is under severe pressure just if you look at the fact that in 1900, healthcare is only 1% of GDP and there were no specialties. And a century later, 2000, it was 14% of GDP. The MDs had 58 specialties and the dentists had nine. And now we're at 2018 and healthcare is 17%. I couldn't imagine – trying to keep up on endo, perio, pedo. I mean, it's just so massively overwhelming. And if you look at the century-long trend, it is trying to specialize. And it seems to me that so many dentists, when their practice overhead is out of control, when their staff has high turnover, they always think they need to go learn another clinical dentistry thing, like oh, they'll add sleep apnea, or they want to go add Invisalign, or they think maybe I should be placing implants. And it's like, well, if a restaurant was failing, would, would anyone smart say, well, maybe if you added lasagna to the menu, everything would work its way out? I mean, um, what would you, um, they always want to do clinical. And when they come to me and they say they want to add implants, I say, well, what are you going to take away? And they say, well, I just, I just want to learn how to do anything. Do you think being a general dentist that can do every single procedure, do you think that's a big element of success or not really? Um, I think it can add to it for sure. And maybe this comes from my background of being a hygienist. I focus on their hygiene department first because prevention is absolutely key to everything you do. It's like building a home on poor foundation. And I'm going to say 99% of the time I walk into an office and their hygiene is at 30% or lower, meaning for every 10 patients that are coming in, only three are returning twice a year for preventive measures. And that, to me, is where we're missing the boat because that's where the restorative treatment planning comes out of. So you can offer all these you know, A to Z procedures that you want to do on the restorative side. If you're not nailing down your prevention, you're missing a big part of it. I agree with you 100% because if, if I took 100 practices that I know that collect a million dollars and the dentist takes home 250, 300, whatever, they don't even do molar endo, place implants, sleep apnea, Invisalign. They just have two or three rock solid hygienists going all the time. And then out of that, they pull enough fillings and crowns 
and then an emergency, maybe some anterior endo or a simple extraction, and they're just crushing it. And then you go across the street to the guy who knows how to do every single procedure and has one hygienist three days a week that they don't have a successful practice. Yeah, what is the saying, a master of all trades, an expert of none? <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, do you think a lot of dentists uh, have a hard time getting motivated about their hygiene department because they, they're down here in Phoenix saying, well, if I pay my hygienist $40 an hour and the insurance company gets me $55 for cleaning, I mean, you know, that, I mean, my hygiene department runs at a loss. What percent of hygiene departments today in the United States do you think run at a break even or a loss? Oh, honestly, like I said, 90, 98% of them. Yeah. I mean, the, honestly, the, there's a there's a 1% that's sitting out there that's doing really well, and that's kind of who we like to work with or the people that want to improve themselves constantly and be willing to say, you know, maybe I could do this a little bit better. I'm great, but I could be better. And this this is irrelevant, kind of relevant. The very first job that I had for the Perio office hired me with no experience, and I want to say I beat 300 other people out. And I said, why? I literally asked the doctor, why me? And he said, honestly, you can train a monkey to do anything, but you can't give him personality. And I think it, it's the same to be said in any hygiene or dental department or any job anywhere. You have to be able to connect with people and want to grow and want to better yourself and not sit yourself behind a title or fear of mentioning something to somebody. You have to be passionate. You have to love what you do, and you have to continue to grow. What percent of dentists do you think do not have enough personality to become an accountant? <laughs> um, almost all. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 did like wants to be with like. So, if you sat at the library for eight years, you think the librarian is the hottest rock star in the world. So, you surround yourself with a bunch of introvert geeks who, and, and they even openly admit that they, um, that the dealing with the patient is the hardest part. Dealing with the right. staff is the second part. They just want to go in and do their work, and and, and then then they look in the eyes and say they don't like to sell dentistry, and you're like. You like maybe maybe with all those characteristics, maybe you should be working for someone else. Yes, exactly. And sometimes that is the recommendation. You shouldn't probably own your own business. You want to show up, do your stuff, and go home. You'd make a great associate. Yeah, and then when they and, and then I've been telling them, you know, one of the biggest messages I've done on my podcast is that again, when a restaurant's failing, you don't sit there and say, well, maybe. Uh, we should get a brick oven and start doing brick oven pieces alongside of our steak. Uh, they they want to go out and buy a $130,000 Levant machine or a $100,000 CVCT or a $100,000 CAD CAM machine. And I always tell them, I've told them probably a couple hundred times on a thousand shows, that the number one return on investment is practice management consultant in, in the office. And everybody I know doing two to four million dollars a year, you say, well, what consultant did you use? They can name half a dozen consultants they use. And, and I, I don't know why the dentist doesn't get that. I mean, they're stressed. They got high overhead. They have staff morale problems. They have turnover problems. And they think the laser is going to fix it. <laughs> well, I'm a super big fan of any kind of technology that's going to better your practice and provide better patient care. I will say that. However, if it's going to be a coat rack or collecting dust in the back, you're right. Don't invest in it. Learn how to use it. Learn how to implement it. Learn how to sell it, quote unquote, because that's what we are is we're selling, we're selling lives. Like, we're, you know, we're, we're selling smiles. So, um, I guess I agree with you at the same token, learn how to make it work. So what kind of programs do you offer? I mean, what, what is your bread and butter program? Is it something you, you go in once a month for a couple of days or is it online? How do you actually coach your offices? It's 100% in person. That's the nice part is so we don't fly to other areas. We're right here in your backyard depending on where you are. Fortune's national, um, including Canada. So it depends. It varies. I can't give you an actual cookie cutter what we do or how it works, but it's very much consulting versus coaching. There's, there's three main aspects of what we do. First and foremost, we're a coach. And I always think of, 
I'm a football kind of girl, so the coach coaches the team to run the plays and do the systems and, and go through the tackles. So we coach majority of the time. Every now and then, yeah, I'm going to have to put on a consultant hat and say, just do this because it works and trust the process. And then in addition to that, when you look at mergers, acquisitions, transitions, retirement, bringing in an associate, whatever that might be, looking at your finance engines, we're key business strategists. And I think that's where we can provide a, a really mass amount of education and help to the dentist that, like you said, doesn't know the accounting side of things. So you're in Salt Lake City, is that right? Right. Yep. So are all your clients then basically Utah? Is that your territory? Yes, majority. I do venture out a little bit. Um, I've got a favorite client out in, I shouldn't say that, but out in Green River, Wyoming. So there's a few outlying areas that we work with people as well. Yeah, I used to lecture in Wyoming at the uh, Grand Tetons. That is, oh, my God, that was beautiful. beautiful. I Gorgeous. couldn't believe it. And I'll, I'll tell you the story because maybe you could believe it. I don't think anybody else. From the airport to the lodge, the taxi guy uh, slowed down and stopped on the side of the road, and I said, what are you doing? And he goes, look by that tree, and there are three bears. <laughs> yeah. And Ryan and I just like, wow, I couldn't believe it. And then he said to me this. It was so funny. He goes, watch, since I stopped, I'll draw commotion. And he goes, he goes, it won't even take five minutes for some idiot to pull over and then get out of his car to take the picture. And sure enough, within five minutes, about five or six cars are pulled over, and some idiot gets out of his driver's side, walks around to the passenger side, and is taking a picture of these bears, which would be like across the street from you. And the taxi <laughs> driver's like, this guy, I mean, can you imagine being that dumb? Uh, but uh, I guess he uh, thinks that the, the bear's name was Winnie the Pooh. So Utah, um, the data I see, Utah is the most competitive market and has the lowest median average income for a general dentist because so many dentists just want to practice there. They're, they're Mormon. They want to go back to their mother country. And that is so valuable to them. They just keep flocking back. And a lot of demographic people just say, no, don't go there, you know, go Go somewhere else. So my question to you is, do demographics matter? Absolutely not. If you look at our Hawaii demographic, that, that would be a very difficult place to do anything because you're stuck on an island. You're, you know, there's a dentist on every four corners. I mean, it's, it's very saturated. So I don't believe that in any way, shape, or form. I believe it's a, a limiting belief and a belief system of what you want to provide. Because, again, the guy across the street may be doing subpar dentistry or not even meeting the standard of care, and you got to focus on yourself. It's absolutely what you want to provide, providing, you know, having that vision, if you will, moving toward that, and what kind of dentist do you want to be? Now, the challenge, I will say out here, is – we have probably the nicest people on the planet, I will say that, and they love to give dentistry away for free. Oh, that's okay. You can pay me later. So it's it's not a quality. It's not a skill level. It is just being a good, wearing that business hat and saying, I'm providing you a value and this is what it costs, and I'm okay saying that. Yeah, giving away dentistry free. I mean, oh, my gosh, my assistants have gotten so mad at me over the years. My, my <laughs> biggest problem is um, – when someone fails a financial policy uh, for an extraction, especially if it's four wisdom teeth, it's like, I don't care, I'll do it for you. I mean, I'd rather pull four wisdom teeth than go to Hawaii. I mean, if I, if I had those two options, it's like, well, she doesn't have any money, so let's just, it only takes me five minutes, let's just do it. <laughs> so uh, I totally get that. So when, um, so you're saying that fortune management um, does better when with elite clients, people who have already, um, who are the top 1%, is that who your target market is? Oh, no. I, I didn't mean to imply it that way. I'm saying we end up working with those people that become the top 1% because of their drive to look at systems and to outsource things to their team, like create a, a middle layer of management, if you will, to where the dentist can focus on dentistry and then the office runs smoothly. So it's just, I mean, our average growth is 30% year over year. And that's what I'm saying is when, when you take a $500,000 practice and turn it the next year into an $800,000 practice or more, we had one right here in Salt Lake that grew 64%, which almost equated to a million in one year. But that's because they did it, they followed it, they believed it, they lived it, they breathed it, and it worked. But it would have been so much better if they just would have spent the 100000 on a CAD cam. <laughs> well, they did because they needed to spend money to offset their taxes. 
<laughs> yeah, there you go. So if, if your if your business is poised for growth, and I know boys love toys, buy a laser. Buy the, you know if you want to play with something that makes you run twenty red lights on the way to work, do it. But don't <laughs> buy that toy because you think that's going to make your office business Agreed. poised for growth. That's a toy, and and I and I've sat there many many times buying insane toys thinking. Well, you know, I could turn around and buy an, a sports car. I don't have, I don't have a two-seater sports car. Or you could sit there and say, I don't want a boat or a cabin. But that's how you should look at this stuff. Because if your business is in, if you're poised for growth and your business is in order, you should be able to buy those things uh, for fun. But you don't buy them as the Hail Mary pass to fix a sinking ship. Absolutely. And one of my favorite sayings ever is culture eats strategy for breakfast. So again, that goes with what you're saying. You can have all the latest, greatest, neatest, brand new toys, the nicest office. If you don't have the right people, the right systems, the right organization, and the greatest monitoring, it can fail you and probably will. Who's the lady in the uh, that psycho show where she was the nurse, the guy ran off the road? Kathy Bates, I said, you know, in real life, Kathy Bates really isn't a nurse who finds stranded passengers in snowbanks and drags them back to their house and beats her. She's, she's, she's Hollywood. She's pretending. So I know you're introvert. I know you don't like to um, lead staff meetings. I know I, I've told them a hundred times that, you know, successful people are the ones willing to have the most, the highest number of uncomfortable conversations. And they always tell me, they say, well, I, I don't like, I don't like that. I mean, on, on dental town, you know how many threads there are? What should I say to my hygienist? And then they're, they're posting all this stuff. And, and you, I'm just reading the thread. Basically, you can just tell he's more afraid of his hygienist than, than King Kong. And it's like, why? Uh, but, but I always tell them, you know, you can just pretend. I mean, you can show up to work and say, look, there's 116 hours in a week, and all but 32 of them, I can be an introvert geek afraid of the world. But now I'm going to walk through that office, I'm going to be a leader, and I'm going to lead the staff, and I'm going to have uncomfortable conversations, and I'm going to have staff meetings. How do you, how do you coach a dentist to be something they're not? I, I think it's I like people to be who they are, and I believe in not necessarily profiling somebody, but understanding what their natural state is, like, say, a color code or a personality or an astrology or whatever that might be. People have their natural uh, adaptive states that they go back into or their automatics, but I believe that you can have an uncomfortable, quote, unquote, conversation and not have it be um, something that's threatening or rude. It's matter of fact. And so that's your business hat. And I think when you, when somebody says, I want to be a better leader and I want to do better things, they're open to the coaching and they're willing to step out of that comfort zone and stretch to be uncomfortable and do great things. And then when they see the results come from it, it's almost eye-opening, like, oh, I could have done this years ago. So instead of having this belief that it's going to cause confrontation, it's going to help create a solution, it, always, it, it ends up working out. Ha, huh, that's uh, and same thing with sales. I mean, almost every dentist says to me, um, I don't like sales. I, I, I just don't like it. How, how do you coach someone who just tells you? I mean, it's like telling a kid to eat their broccoli. I mean, do you, you just make them eat until they cry? Or what do you tell somebody that says, I don't, I don't like that? Well, I think it comes down to the power of good questions and understanding the why behind that. Why, what, you know, what is it that, why did you get into dentistry in the first place? What is it that you love? What is it that you value? How do you express this through communication to your patients or your team members? And I think when people really go back, it's like the five-year-old thing. Why, 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 why? Once you really get to the why, all of a sudden they realize what their vision is. And I keep going back to this vision statement, but I truly believe if I said I want to go on vacation and I get in the car and I have no idea where I'm going, how do I even know when I got there? You've got to start out with some kind of vision. And if your vision is to create beautiful smiles, life lasting, you know, changing people's lives, saving their lives, then that changes the conversation that you have with them and you're not fearful to bring things up. You don't feel like you're selling. You feel like you're giving. Do you think DSOs are going to continue their uh, growth, um, just unbridled growth? Do you think they're going to, like, double in the next 10 years, or do you think there um, there's some holes in their strategy and they're not going to be as successful as they think they are? 
I hate to guesstimate, but what I what I do believe is that if they continue down the path of quote unquote being cattle prodding, you know, patients, the more we educate patients, the better they understand the quality that they receive. And I think DSOs can be a great place. And I think if they run it correctly and they run it based on the patient and not on numbers, then yeah, I mean, they could be around and they could double. But if it continues the way that I've personally witnessed it, I'm not sure that it meets the needs of the clinician or the patients. And, and we get better and smarter year after year after year. I mean, look at 100 years ago what we were doing versus now. And I think if we are aware of that and in tune with that and we educate our patients more than a commercial saying, brush your teeth twice a day, go to the dentist once a year, whatever it might be, I think then, then absolutely um, the general dentist, which we call a dying breed, still has a chance. You know, you just sang the song for uh, Amos and Andy of Pepsodent. Uh, and it was, it's funny, it, it was to show you how powerful marketing is, they ran that commercial so many times, made Pepsodent the number one brand, even though it didn't even have fluoride in there. That was... Uh, that was a uh, uh, Crest and Colgate secret agreement. Remember, it was Crest with MFP. Yeah. Well, what's MFP? Maximum fluoride protection. But the insurance <laughs> company saw that commercial so many times, they just covered cleanings twice a year. It shows you the power of advertising. When you go into your client's office, is <clears throat> lack of advertising and new patient flow usually uh, a major problem that needs to be correct? Or is it more, uh, or is that usually not the uh, big issue? Actually, it's it's the opposite, um, and I don't know if this is an area type thing. I know on average dentists get about 20 new patients a year, or sorry, a month. Excuse me, that's the national average. I have I have multiple offices out here getting over 100. The the additional challenge to that is that's great. I mean that's wonderful, but there's a revolving back door. They're not sticking around, and you're not maintaining the people that already love you and call you their dentist. So, again, going back to hygiene and just focusing on what everybody wants to have new patients and more patients. Well, if you can't even focus on the ones that you have, then maybe we need to look at a different strategy. Now, since you're from Utah, are you biased towards Dentrix? Are you just going to tell everyone to buy Dentrix because they're your homies? Well, I have to I have to just put out a disclaimer. I'm from California, and that will never change. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not biased to any product per se if it works well and you utilize it to its best advantage. I personally, as a dental hygienist, am an Eagle Soft fan just because I've used it for years. I started out on Softent. That's how long I've been in this. And I love them all. But you have to use them. There's, there's something to be said. It's like having an iPhone and, and using two apps on it. What's the point? Why don't you just have an older phone? Now, I'm so old. After 31 years, we just finally got off Softent, mainly just because it was <laughs> crashing all the time. And my tech support guy would just look at me saying, I'm pretty sure there's something wrong with this. <laughs> and uh, so we got on Dental Town, and we, we went with Open Dental. Any, any, any thoughts on Open Dental? I think it's great. Um, I don't have one person out here in Utah utilizing it, but I've heard great things. I want to say it's a complimentary service, so there's no fee. That has to be a nice thing. Um, again, I'm not biased against any system as long as you're using it. You have to utilize the features. Otherwise, it's not serving you. So when you go into an office, you know, uh, when a patient comes in, as a hygienist, you want x-rays, exam, you, you know, you want to get an A on the exam. What kind of metrics are you looking at? When, you, when a dentist calls you up and you go there and look at their office and you jump on their practice management system, what, what key metrics are you looking at that could be, uh, um, you know, form your opinion of what you've got going on? There, gosh, there's so many. I mean, when we go in, we'll we'll run a compliment. If somebody's interested in bringing us in, I say test drive us. Let's let's look at a 10,000 foot view of what's going on in your office, and we'll do a complimentary practice analysis. It's basically a 15 to 20 page document of everything from the financials to the systems to the organization to the people, everything. I mean, literally everything. A very, going back to my hygiene roots once again, a very simple, very simple metric that I would tell anybody to follow is look at what your active patient count is and look at how many limited exams you've done in the past 12 months. And if you're not, you ideally you should be doubling that. And if, if you're nowhere around the 70% mark, 
you are missing the boat on your current patients. Stop spending money on marketing. Stop trying to get new patients in and focus on the ones that already love you. Okay. Um, I asked all of my patients if they love me, and they all said no. <laughs> uh, I doubt that. So on, what is your definition of an active patient? So the two biggest systems are Dentrix and Eaglesoft. How, how does someone listening to you right now when they get to work pull up their computer and find out how many active patients. What would your definition? Is that just someone who was in one time in the last 12 months? I would say anybody that has sat their rear in your chair in the past 18 months considers you their dentist. Okay, 18 months. So, you, so you're going a year and a half. Yep. And then, and then you want them to run how many limited exams they had in the last 12 months, or is that the last 18 months? 12 months. Okay, so so give us a metric. So limited exams, you want that to be how is that? D O one two O, right? D O one two O. So if you are, I I mean, in every practice, you should be doing an exam twice a year, regardless what you believe in X-rays. You should be doing an exam, and if if your patients, if if Say you have a 1,000 patients that say you're my dentist and a 1,000 patients have been in in the past 18 months, but yet your limited exam count is only at 500, you're missing a huge part of your practice, and it's usually 30%. It's usually 300. I'm, I'm giving it a little bit of better percentage there. It's usually, it's usually what percent? 30% or lower. I've seen as low as 12%. Wow. I mean, yeah, I, I think the uh, the corporate culture is bizarre. Like, like you hear some of the biggest names in dentistry talking about the new patient experience. I mean, well, Southwest Airlines wouldn't talk about the new patient experience because everybody's flown Southwest at least once. Walmart, Costco. I mean, uh, I, and even the high end market. I mean, Chanel number five. I mean, I mean, wouldn't it be it is every patient experience? I mean, and then they talk about marketing, winning new patients. And it just looks like it's 30-year-old metrics that you want a new patient with an awesome new patient experience when the Fortune 500s blew past that a decade ago. And they, went, they, they, went, um, they don't do advertising for new patients. They do loyalty programs to keep existing programs. And they spend their money in increasing the experience while you're flying American Airlines. Not trying to find that one guy that's never flown American before and looking for a new patient, and then everybody treats him differently when he walks on the plane because he's brand new. I mean, it, they really are behind. I mean, imagine retaining only 10 to 30 percent of your patients and really think that advertising for more new patients is the key. Yeah, and I do think you need a mix. You need old and new, right? It keeps you moving and shaking and all that good stuff. And I think that you absolutely should have some kind of patient loyalty program. Here's my example. In one of the offices I worked at for many years who did fantastic, they did have a new patient experience per se because they're brand new and, and it's exciting and they've not been in and they, they don't have that relationship or that rapport. So there was a walk you through the office and introduce you to certain people and show you where the sterilization is and how clean we are. But in the hygiene realm, because we were perio, every single patient that kept that three-month appointment got a brand new Sonicare brush head to go home. They never had to buy another toothbrush. It's kind of like the whole whitening for life situation. You know, have a program that meets your current patient needs, something, patient of the month. And um, what about staff meetings uh, and morning huddles? You know, it's amazing. I'm really surprised at how many million-dollar practices say, no, we don't use the morning huddle, and other ones swear by it. It seems like some say it's the, the secret sauce, and others say, no, we don't even use it. I am a 100% firm believer that you should be having some form of a huddle, whether it be morning or evening or both, ideally, and a weekly meeting. If you're not talking about what's going on in your business, then how are you focusing on what's not working and what is? I go to my local grocery store, and they have huddles in the produce section, for goodness sakes. Yeah, that's the one section I've never gone to. I only go... <laughs> I only well, you live in the, Arizona. I only go to the processed foods <laughs> and then the liquor department. Um, we so, don't have uh, those here. But if I lined 100 dentists up against the wall and I said, what makes you not want to go to work? What just makes your stomach just, ah, it's always staff. I mean, it's always staff. And they, they, they have staff turnover. They, I mean, what, what do you, how do you, um, when you go into an office, what percent of the time is the staff not happy, harmonious, and have equilibrium? 
Honest to goodness, and this is where I have to give Utah a plug, they call it Happy Valley for a reason. The turnover here is very low, very, very low. Culture is definitely not the issue. It tends to be my patients don't want to accept treatment, and so I, I feel a bit deflated. I'm not good at what I do. So here, very low. When I lived in Nevada, really high. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe that is a, a territorial thing or a geographical thing. Yeah, I also think, um, you know, the, the term I hate the most is the United States of America, because how could you compare Salt Lake City to Manhattan? How could you compare Anchorage, Alaska to Detroit? I mean, we really, um, the Federal Reserve even says, and it's published some really interesting papers, how the United States really has nine different economic regions flying into the same flag. And I, I think that um, transient societies are more related to transient staff turnover uh, then when you go into a town of 5,000 and everybody was born there, there's just massively less staff turnover. I would agree. I, I was a sales rep in Las Vegas for about a whole year, and I can't tell you how many times I was reintroducing myself every three weeks. <laughs> so, yes, absolutely. I want to ask you another cultural thing and um, see if it's different in Utah. Um, everyone knows when you get married that half of them fail in divorce. And um, I, I know the divorce rates are coming down simply because as the average age of the first marriage goes up, divorce rates come down. I mean, if you get married between 16 and 18, you don't have nearly as chance if you get married between 26 and 29. That's obvious. But when, when half the marriages fail, yeah, I've always seen dentists want to be partner with another dentist. And I, and I sit there and say, really? You really want to be married at home and married at work? What, what have you, you've been in this field a long time. What do you, what do you think about, uh, two dentists getting married and becoming partners at work? Um, they think, you know, uh, the sum of the whole is greater, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This will be a really smart move. Good move most of the time or not so much. I think it depends on the person, honestly, and are, are you too similar that you can't work together? Are, are your visions the same? Do you believe in the same philosophies? Uh, it's like raising children. You know, you've got to be on the same page, and even if you aren't, you have to be able to have that uncomfortable conversation, if you will, or corrective conversation to say, look, this is what we believe in. This is what we're going to do moving forward, and I've seen very many, many, many successful Mary, you know, office relationships, if you will, work just because they're on the same page and they're talking about it. People that stick their head in the sand are the ones that aren't making it work very well. Okay, now I want to ask you a, a selfish question for me just for Arizona. I got two dental schools down here. We got AT Still Mesa. We got Midwestern Glendale. I don't know what percent is, but at least 20% of the class has got to be LDS, and they all want to go back to Salt Lake City. They're in dental school now. The podcast is mostly consumed by Almost everyone that emails me, Howard, in fact, please email me, Howard at dentaltown.com, tell me who you are. I would say almost all of them want to go back to Salt Lake City. Talk to that person. What, what, what should they do? I actually taught at both of those schools when I worked for Phillips, and it is not saturated here like people believe, honestly. And I'll tell you why. If you want to come straight out of school and build a brand new office and be the sole owner and the very new person, there's still opportunity for that. There's even more opportunity for people to bring in associates when you're fresh off the boat, if you will. You're coming right out of dental school. You know everything, but your speed's not there. And you've got people that are willing to, to mentor you and bring you into their practice and have some kind of buy-in ownership. Why in the heck wouldn't you take care or take advantage of that? So I, I think if, if you have that idea that it's saturated and I can't go back to my, my homeland or hometown or be by my family, then I would say you're not utilizing your resources and you're not reaching out to the right people. There's, there's social media. There's all kinds of, there's, you know, dentalpost.net. There's all these different resources online. Utilize them. You're a hygienist and an MBA. Um, let's talk hygiene compensation. Do you, some people say when you pay a hygienist $40 an hour that they're just like a um, vodka drinking Russian, just, you know, communism. Other people say America was built on incentives. Incentives matter. So hygiene compensation, where, where yeah, are you more hourly, are you more bonus, are you straight production? I'm both, I, and I've worked all three, to be honest with you. I've been straight commission, I've been straight daily wage, hourly wage, whatever you want to call it, and I'm a firm believer in some kind of bonus program that involves your entire team minus the producing doctors. 
your producers should be part of it absolutely and it should be based on production because that gives them a good eye this is the business side of looking into if you're not bringing in 30 percent of the production into that practice then then you're not carrying your weight and you're just getting paid to be there and, and you're not, you're actually missing a lot of things, in my experience, that they taught you in school to look for or do. You're skipping a lot of things and you're not talking about things. You know, people have bloody profies and you're bringing them in every six months. Utilize the new hygiene code. Talk about different products that work, like AuraCare or, or varnishes or whatever that might be. I, I'm a firm believer in incentivizing every team member as long as it goes back to the business and makes sense. We have really good data about how dental office overhead has been drifting up for 30 years. I mean, when I got out of school 30 years ago and was, um, my patients were, uh, Barney Rubble and his wife Wilma, um, it was just routine to have 50% overhead. Now, now they say the average is 65% overhead. Uh, um, a lot of people, um, a lot of people think 20% of dental offices have over 80% overhead. Um, when you talk to a dentist about overhead, I mean, um, staff salaries, uh, or just just every time the earth goes around the sun, everyone on your team wants a dollar an hour raise. I mean, it's just based on the zodiac. I mean, they, they sit there with their astrology charts, and they tell you <laughs> in 20 days, earth will pass. Um, so what should staff salary be, and is it often high overhead? Is that often uh, a big problem that you see in dental offices? So, wow, when you see uh, labor or team overhead at 30 to 35 percent, is that something where you grow your way out of it by increasing production, treatment plan acceptance? Or do you sometimes have to go in there and say, uh, Monica, uh, we can't pay you $45 an hour. We have to cut you down to 40. Oh, no. Uh, the first question is, oh, gosh, if my overhead's high, do I need to let people go or cut their wages? And I say, absolutely not. You need to increase production slash collections. And so uh, when we talk about our national average of growth is about 30 percent, I immediately suggest that they put some kind of incentive program in place. And they say, I can't afford it. I can't do it. And I say, you're already paying them too much. You know, you're, you're already your overhead's already too high and they're not loving you for it. So let's make this work for the business and let's make this work for your team. And it works. It, it turns itself around and the production goes up and they focus on the numbers and they start having those uncomfortable conversations. And so nobody takes a pay cut. That is not my recommendation. So what, so what are your plans? What, what type of bonus systems do you recommend? It is based 100% off of the net collections total and then the gross salaries. Okay, so explain to the net collections. They're in a biology class right now. <laughs> so net collections is the real money, right? So when you say you've produced $100,000, but you only collected, let's say, 80,000 80, of that, 80,000 is the real money. You might have produced more, but you didn't collect that. That's, not, that's monopoly money at that point. Yeah, and they're, but they're, but they had the money. What's also sad is the money they didn't collect. They still paid for the hygienist to do the cleaning. They paid for the dental materials. They paid for the assistants to, to do all of that. I mean, all that money. So if the average overhead is 65% and you produced 80, but, or produced 100 and collected 80, $20,000 of dentistry was done at two thirds overhead. I, I mean, I, I still think, um, the number one cause of overhead is uh, the PPO fee schedule. I mean, a dentist tell you they charge $1,000 for a crown, and then they sign up for all these PPOs, and the average crown's paying them, you know, $600. Well, that means 40% of their overhead is just from PPO. Number two would be team, but the collection policy sometimes 
is one, two, or three? Um, yes, and I don't believe in being a victim to the insurance companies. I will say that it's a benefit, and we need to, again, better educate and not be run by the fees. And if you're getting paid 40 cents on the dollar by an insurance company just to have patients come into your practice, then you might want to look at negotiating those fees and increasing your fees. Um, there's a lot of tactics out there, obviously, but I just don't believe in being a victim to that because that's not fair to the patient and it's not fair to the dentist. Are you having any success with your clients in negotiating the, uh, with the PPOs to pay higher fees? I sure am. Wow. Talk about that. I don't have much to say about it because I don't handle that portion. A company that I have worked with many a times is called Practice Quotient, and they're out of New York, and they work their magic in so many ways. Um, I'll give you an example. They've turned some, you know, like if you're on a, a poor paying plan, they might turn you into a premier. So, again, if you're 40 cents on the dollar, now you're getting 65 cents on the dollar. Still not ideal, but much better. In some cases, you were getting 52 cents on the dollar, and they grouped it into this, you know, seven different insurance carriers or PPO carriers now became this one plan. It did nothing to change anything for the patients, but now you're getting paid 85 cents on the dollar. Again, I can't, I can't talk their magic. I don't know what they do, but I've had a lot of success. So, you like, so you're recommending practice quotient? I, I love them very much, yes. And who's, been the, great. who's the top dog down there? Patrick O'Rourke is the CEO. Patrick O'Rourke. Well, you should email him and tell him uh, to come on the show and, <laughs> and talk about that. And so then if you're – I know you only got uh, two more minutes um, – if someone was starting out, do you recommend they sign up for every PPO, or do you, or you recommend that they, uh, you know, to get going, or do you recommend they avoid that? I'm a huge fan of insurance for, for a specific reason. It is a form of marketing, and if you look at it like that and you utilize it to the best advantage that you have, if you have no patience, you have nowhere to go but up. So, yes, I don't think that there's anything wrong as a brand-new person out of school signing up with everything out there, great. As you get successful and you learn the traits and you increase your speed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then you can be a little bit more picky. Somebody that's been in the industry 10, 15, 17, 20 years, absolutely not. I think you should, you should pick and choose a little bit of what you need. And I'm a huge fan of in-office plans, an absolute huge fan, and that's where I think the future is heading. And who do you recommend to set up in-office plans? Um, you know, Fortune actually has their own program that they offer. And I, you know, so obviously I would recommend that, Plan for Health. Um, there's, there's, you can even handle it yourself internally as long as you have the right metrics and the right things put into place. So it's, it's just, in order to be successful, you've got to have your ducks in a row. <laughs> That's all I would say. Your website is fortunemgnt.com for fortunemanagement.com, fortunemgnt.com. Um, it was just an honor for you to come on the show today. Is there any question I wasn't smart enough to ask? No, I've enjoyed my time, and I appreciate it, Howard. Thank you. I love your podcast. Oh, thank you so much. I hope you have a rocking hot day. Hey, you too. All right, <laughs> bye-bye.